As I've been had the opportunity and privilege to do some more teaching, I've been working with a friend of mine who specializes in education, and she has taught me something wonderful. And I, I tell you this because you're probably involved in some kind of education because you're here and you're involved with children's ministry. And it is called Anchor, Add, Apply, and Away. I find this a marvelous tool to use as I'm involved in engaging in education. Anchor the subject in somebody's own experience, add to it in terms of information or content, apply it to our own context and think about what we're going to take away. So that's my plan this morning to anchor us in the, this idea about stories, to add some things that I think are interesting for us to talk about, to uh, apply it to our own context and think about what we might like to take away this morning. So my first question, I invite you to turn to the person beside you and um, think about a story that has uh, shaped you and if you have any ideas why. So just, what, what story has shaped you? Just talk for a minute and, and see what you think. An aha moment. Nobody is 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 perfect. We are all earthly and we are all imperfect yeah. in our own ways. Wow. I'm so glad you said that we're gonna talk about aha moments in a little bit. Thank you so much for sharing that. Those are all wonderful stories. We could spend the whole morning um, sharing the stories that have shaped us and it would be an incredibly edifying. Maybe we'll do some of that over lunch. Stories are incredibly powerful things. I remember when my children were about three and they were going off to school and they were hearing all kinds of wonderful fairy tales and they would come out and they were so deeply living in these stories that their role play would continue into our home. So they would be brave princesses and angry dragons, they would be wise wizards or witches, they would be the third son who feels lost and confused. What the fairy tales were doing were giving them the archetypal cast of characters in ways that would help them explore parts of who they were. And I find it just pretty incredible to watch my own children. One was very quiet and um, very shy and would just love to take on the, the part of the angry dragon. That, that somehow that let her explore a part of herself that she wasn't exploring in other ways at that particular time of her development. And how our children would choose different characters from the stories that somehow met a very deep need in them or that helped them work something out in their own lives, in their own becoming. And I found this incredible. It just kind of, as I watched them, blew my mind. I wanted to apply this to their faith story because I felt that the Bible stories had something to offer them as well, that certainly the fairy stories were had a lot, I really believe, a lot to offer our children. Um, they've lasted for centuries. There's a reason for that. But the, it, it was there a way that I could invite my children into the Bible stories in a similar way so that they could become alive in them and they would discover something about who they are in God's story. And so I was seeing my children do this quite naturally and they would build castles and moats and draw bridges and I thought, this is great. Stories are capturing their hearts and imaginations. 
And so, I, and it just, my brain started going, my imagination started going. I, I started talking to friends who were seeing the same thing in our own kids. We weren't really hanging this on anything other than a gut that our kids were wired for stories. I later learned that developmentally, children are wired for stories um, like they're wired for mud. And it's not really until they get to kind of, depending on the child, kind of age 10, 11, 12, that actually this ability for abstract thinking is actually going to kick in. And so much of what we were doing with children in the church was reflecting on these abstract concepts and the children were not engaged in it. And, teachers were not enjoying it because the kids were not into it and we were just spinning around um, as me, somebody pointed out Andrew pointed out the little font says suffer the little children we were suffering the children we were all suffering in this and um, it just wasn't working and we had a feeling some gut intuition that stories were a big part of this and that the Bible story was really important to invite our children into and their kids were going to respond to this. Some words about stories. Um, a ch early childhood development specialist, Kieran Egan, whom I really like, says for children, meaning is built into stories. They use narrative to make sense out of the world and he's written volumes and volumes on this about how stories for young children that some of it, it helps them make sense out of who they are. Um, Eugene Peterson says, the best stories do not help us escape from the real world, but touch the real story at such a deep level that we wake up and find ourselves in the wonder of the real story again, that the stories can wake something up in us, not an escape from reality, but a drawing into reality. Jesus understood a lot about story. He um, is with his disciples, and in the, the Gospel of, I think it's Matthew, he tells them stories all day long. Whoops, because I want to read this. Um, telling us that, Matthew tells us that Jesus' storytelling brought things out into the open that had been hidden since the world's first day. Through, through storytelling, Jesus was using this technique, this thing that's just innate to us as humans, to wake us up to God's presence from the creation of the world. The Bible stories took place in particular places and times. And so we start by asking, what happened in them. But where I want children to get to is how do I get in on this story? What is my role to play in it? We could spend the whole morning, I could give you just a ton of theory on story, but I don't think that would really be what we need. Ivy Beckwith has done some terrific work on this in formational children's ministry. Uh, Jerome Berryman has done terrific work on this and inviting people into the story. There's a lot of great theory around this. We decided we were going to invent a story-based ministry, and we were going to, and I'm, as I say, tell you this story, I'm not against curriculum at all. I think curriculum can be very, very good and life-giving, but we, were, we had had enough of it for a bit, and we just wanted to tell our kids the story from beginning to end and invite them in. So that's what we were going to do, and uh, we thought, you know, we were very nervous. It felt risky. Were they going to get bored? Or... We, we'd repeated a lot of the stories, and the adults were quite nervous about this, but the kids actually loved it. I know in my house, there was never a sense of familiar stories getting old. In my house, there would be a book that the kids loved, and they'd say, not, oh, we had this one yesterday, read it again, read it again. And I remember reading my kids the same story 15 times of a night. And so we had a sense that kids were going to love getting into the stories and just living into them. We needed to slow things down and just enter the story. And how were we going to do this? So I'm going to share with you a few ideas, and um, then we're going to do some things. And we can talk about this as we're, um, we can kind of pause along the way, and we can share ideas and ways, things we've tried that might work. 
Um, one of the people that I've really been influenced is, is a man named Jerome Berryman who does godly play, and he's developed this sense of wondering with children. It comes out of Montessori education. Um, I know there's some godly play trainers here today. It's a great um, curriculum. It's a great approach. Um, but I'm going to propose something different, but I'm drawing on quite a lot of his ideas. I had um, was going to tell you about childhood and simplicity in imagination and wonder all in a different order and then just two nights ago when I was looking at my notes I realized if I said embrace childhood instead of childhood we could spell the word wise and I thought okay that might help us frame things so I've kind of moved my talk around from a time I did it a while ago and we're going to see how this goes I think one of the um, things that helps children get into the story is, is the ability to wonder. Has anybody used this approach in their churches? I, uh, I you, you guys have used it. Wonder is an amazing thing. Somebody talked about the aha moment. I think you did as you shared your story. I remember this became really clear to me. Um, oh, God, I, I was going to talk about Berryman's work. Um, and here, here are his questions. Um, Things like, we, what we decided to do was we adapted his wondering questions, and we decided you could use them with just about any Bible story. So questions he gives us like this. I wonder who you would be in the story. I wonder who else was there. I wonder what happened next. And we realized we actually didn't need to write a new lesson for every story. We needed to enter into the story and wonder about it. Um, as we started, as the kids started getting used to this, it was incredibly free how they would get into this and really wonder. I wonder what did happen next, and sometimes we're told, and sometimes we're not. And early on, I had a, a profound experience with young children. I was subbing in an emergency sub and I didn't have a chance to um, prep anything. And the story was the ten lepers. And one of them comes back to say thank you. So you're probably familiar with the story. And I had no props and I had a little basket of nuts. So I got ten walnuts and a pine cone for Jesus and uh, built a little temple and had the little lepers walk out and ask Jesus to heal me. Jesus, son of God, savior, heal us. And he does. Uh, he tells them to go to the temple and they get healed and one comes back to say thank you and I was just with, there with the children thinking I, I, had, I had no planning so I wondered legitimately wondered I wonder what happened next because I said this one went off it was almost like this little piggy and this one went off and this one went off and I said I wonder where they went don't you where'd they go and the children got so deeply into this. And finally one of them said, well, this one went off to have a snack. And I thought, yeah, we don't, maybe. Another child said, well, this one went off to have a nap. You're like, this is a pretty big or you've been healed of leprosy. You've, had, you've been an outcast all your life. You've had this healing experience. You've probably exhausted. And then, this, then the one child said, this one went off to gather jewels for Jesus. And I thought, you guys are into this. <laughs> you are wondering your theological imagination has woken up. And it was just a magical teaching moment for me, thinking, I wonder, I, I really do wonder. And then I, I invited them to engage, use a different open-ended tools. And uh, one girl drew a rainbow. I had no idea what she was doing. But we came back together and we told the story one more time and some of them had built little puppets and they brought their own learning to it. And um, we told the story with all their imaginings and the fellow, one leper came back to say thank you and the child held up a rainbow and said, this is where the rainbow comes into the story. And I thought, I could not have invited them into a better engagement than they came up with by releasing their theological imaginations and inviting them to explore this. And I learned so much from this. It was incredibly powerful. But I think often we steal the aha moment from our children. 
when we were first exploring this, we were doing the story of Jesus calming the storm. And we were, uh, we built a boat and we had um, all kinds of engagement. Like we, some of the kids were holding big sheets of fabric and they were a storm and the disciples were in the boat. And it was this wildness in our children's ministry era, a wild storm. And Jesus stood up and said, peace, be still. And it was like this. It was so quiet. It was a holy magic moment. And then the teacher said, this means that we should all trust Jesus and we don't have to be afraid. And it was like the whole thing was killed. It was killed because this is how the story goes. Uh, evening came, Jesus said to the disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. Um, the wind comes up, they're frantic. Help us, teacher, don't you care? He rebukes the wind, calms it down. He says, why were you so fearful? And then the story goes like this. And they were filled with awe. Some versions said, and they were filled with wonder. Who is this man that even the winds and waves obey him. And we were there in the story, wondering, who is this man? And we, we debrief, this, debrief this as a team of leaders afterwards, because what the teacher had done was stolen the children's aha moment, stolen that chance to have the same experience that the disciples had, to wonder, who? is this man? And maybe live in that for a really, really long time. Years and years and years. And so we debriefed this and we said, you know, it wasn't this person's, like, we, this, we all do this. We're so tempted to wrap the lesson up in a nice, neat package and end it. But, and that's not what the Bible does. That's part of the problem I was talking about this morning, that we, we tell the story and then we give it a moral lesson, package it up and say, behave well, and send them off. But this is how it goes. This is how the story ends. The disciples were filled with awe and wonder. And so many of the Bible stories bring us there. Now, some Bible studies do say, go and do likewise. That's fine. Let's, let's learn about that. Let's live in that, too. But most often, they don't. Most often, they bring us into this deep place of wonder. Um, what, what do you think? Do you have any experience of this? I want to kind of hear from you. What, what do you think about wondering with children? They feel risky? Yeah. I've seen the videos of your group of children all sitting in rapid attention. That's not me I want to see. Okay. I have like 15 kids that are in a wide age group. Um, I'm telling them the story and some of them are really, you know, they're, they're in it. But there's always the kids and the, the boys in the back row who are um, taking that opportunity to hit each other. And, Perfect. Uh, they're, they're pitching you around. I always have the second level with me, and they sort of you know, lay their hand on or you know, move the kids apart. But you know, it's very rare when you get the whole group sort of in that moment. Uh -huh. And it's often hard to sort of work with those kids who most of have this whole thing going on. I can't thank you enough. You could not have set up my next point better. Thank you for that. Um, imagination. We are embodied, right? Like, we are not passive consumers who are going to sit and listen to um, a telling of a story. The reason the kids were so into this holy moment of peace be still was because they had been so stormy, right? They had been so engaged in the story. So, um, we want to get them in, right? Because if you notice that same group of kids who are squabbling and fighting and punching each other, maybe we have a distant problem that needs to be nurtured, directed. Chances are, though, we're not meeting them as children, as physical beings. Children are wired to wiggle. Because I'm from the Anglican tradition, we do some really liturgical things. We stand up, sit down, jump around, clap around, wiggle. And um, if I was doing a different workshop, I'd be showing you that kind of thing. Because we're people who it's good that we're in our bodies. So um, we want to engage them 
so that their natural wiggly energy is actually directed towards engaging with what we're doing. So how are we going to do that? Let me give you some ideas. What is this? Kitchen. Yeah. What would you do with it? Dinner. Dinner. Okay. What else would you do with it? Dishes. What's that? Dishes. Dishes. Yep. Yeah. Restaurant. restaurant. Yeah. What else would you do with it? Fried eggs. Fried eggs. Good. Playhouse. Playhouse. What's that? Bang, pots. Bang pots and pans. Yeah. Yeah. All kinds of things. Okay. What is this? What would you do with this? Uh, spaceship. spaceship. What else? Castle. Boat. Castle. Castle. House. House. Puppet theater. Puppet theater. Dungeon. Box. What's that? Jack in, the box. Jack in the box. When we give our kids a kitchen, they're going to play, probably, play house. When we give our kids less, we fully engage their imagination. Does anybody remember playing with a cardboard box? Hours and hours and hours. So our experience has been, the less we give children, the more we engage their imagination and the more they are drawn in. So we have, for the Bible stories that we are involved with, we have very, very simple props that we use that could be anything. And they look a lot like this. Um, they are this kind of stand that we um, make. I'm going to use some chairs. We've got clips and we have a bunch of different colors of fabric for a dollar a meter. And we build the story. So we might read or tell some people are very gifted telling stories. Some people aren't. So if you're not gifted telling a story, read it out of a book. There's no crime in that. But the, the thing is, we don't want to just give the kids a story that will stay in their brains. We want to draw them in and engage their imaginations. So what could we build? What could we, how could we draw the children in. Just think about it for a minute. Because you know what? If you were six, you'd have some ideas. We use this almost every week in our children's church. And um, from the time we're starting to tell the story, I would say something like, I wonder what we need to tell this story. And the kids might decide to build a boat. Or they might build a bridge. Well, I don't know what they're going to do. And there's some ris risky about this. Because once you open that up and invite imagination, there's no telling what's going to happen. So for example, in our story-based lectionary, Noah's Ark came up um, a few weeks ago. And we had a marvelous craft that um, was prepared and a marvelous snack. And we told that we read the story of Noah's Ark and we said, I wonder what we need. And the kids said, well, obviously we need an ark. So they spent quite a bit of time building an ark out of capes and duct tape and um, chairs and these stands. And, and they were there. It was a quite a complicated boat because there were five year olds up to 11 year olds that day. It was quite a, an unusually large age span. And they were all in it. And then they got in the boat and we told the story again. And then we needed the storm. So some kids came out and they were the storm. So now, and the wiggly ones, I might say, I wonder if you'd like to be the storm. <laughs> and usually something will come up that, that actually can take that energy and draw them, not to distract from what we're doing, but draws them into what we're doing. The louder they get, you're going to give them a part of thunder, or I don't know what, or ask them, you know, wow, I see you're really bringing a lot of energy and noise. What part of the storm is that? And let them own it. So we had a group of kids who would not come out of the ark. So finally we brought the snack in, and somebody had had the foresight. Adults bring some of this, and one adult had brought a can of sardines. So we put it in there, and it smelled kind of fishy. And that was great, but it was all child-led. And then we had them come out and um, 
uh, at one at a time as burrs to see if they could get the olive branch. Did they come back and they couldn't? They couldn't find it. Eventually, they found it, and we said, the storm's over, and they didn't want to come out of that the dark. They just wanted to stay in there. And we said, guys, we've got a craft, we've got this, and they said, no, no, we're, we're in the ark, we're playing Noah's ark, and they wanted to rebuild it and renovate and all kinds of things. So they were so deeply into that story. And think about it. If you were at home on a rainy day and you gave those kids stuff to build a fort, you give them a bunch of blankets and chairs, they're not going to get tired for hours, right? So, because that's what children do. Children have such great imaginations. And when we give them time and space and opportunity and freedom to explore these things, they are in and so deeply engaged. And then we start to wonder with them. So as I'm presenting this, can you see this happening with these boys in your church? It's not going to go the way we think, usually. <laughs> but, but it doesn't. <laughs> Um, we a certain amount, it has to be, you have to be willing to give up your agenda and your Thank you. Cap, but we don't have time to do it because then go where the kids want to go. You know, I called my talk the risk of imagination. And it's risky because when we have a story and we have the imagination of children and we have God's spirit coming in and who you don't know what's going to happen, but it's it's always more than we could have imagined. So we kept our craft set up. It was quite a wonderful craft. We kept it up because we said, oh, next week we're doing, we were working through Genesis. So the next week it was, I think, the Tower of Babel. And we had blocks and we were building and all kinds of things. And um, we didn't get to it. <laughs> we didn't get to the craft again because the kids were so into building the story physically in their bodies and wondering about it. and. Um, we said, okay, we'll leave the craft up again. Four weeks. We were into the middle of Abraham before we got to this craft. Not that I'm not, I'm not against crafts at all. It's just that children are naturally wired for story. They're in their bodies. And if we can invite them in and give them time to stay there, it's very, very risky. But it's pretty amazing what can happen. And I'm proposing very, very simple props. Because if we give them an ark or a kitchen, we're going to tell them what to do with that. And if we give them something open-ended, then they're going to bring to it. It's going to wake up something in them, and they're going to own it. Have you seen this happen with children? Has anybody seen a kid with a cardboard box? And has anybody been amazed at what children come up with? It's, uh, it's kind of the endless curriculum. <laughs> It really is. The imagination of a child. You're, you're, and once we started getting comfortable with this, it became so much easier for us as teachers because it took the pressure off planning something great. Because the kids were going to come up with something great. And we were going to invite them. We were going to share the story with them, give them some structures, give them a snack. Maybe a, if, it's a, if it's Joan and the Whale, bring a tin of sardines and get the smells going. But we were going to let them live in it. Um, so, we've talked about wonder and imagination. Um, any thoughts on this? Anything anybody wants to? I would actually argue for the abolition of the prescribed craft in the children's ministry. Ha <laughs> ha! Tell us about that. Well, because of the, the prescribed craft is all the exercise of the imagination of the dad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Andrew, thank you. When my daughter was three, she went to vacation Bible school. I, I didn't grow up in this culture. This was new to me, but I thought, I'm a good Christian parent. I'm an Anglican priest, for goodness sake. I'm going to go to, we're going to bring our kids to this. And it was jungle theme. Wonderful, well-intentioned people. And the craft was a lion. And the, all the pieces were cut out. And you're supposed to make your lion. It had nothing to do with anything, really. But the leader came to my daughter and said, and my daughter was doing something very wonderful and creative. It wasn't going to look like her lion, but the leader said, the nose goes there. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> like, how could this really matter? And what you're teaching my child is, is killing her creativity. And that was really when I thought, I've got to start rethinking children in the church because this cannot be their experience of God. The nose goes there. So one of the things that we've done 
it's because it, some people have trouble letting go of crafts, and some people like crafts. I hate crafts because I hate cleaning things up. But what we, what, one of the things that we did was we said, how can we, if we want to do crafts, how can we let it engage the imagination? And so what we did was we banned coloring sheets, just as a universal blanket. We said, um, give, we can give blank paper and pastels or paints or crayons or something, but it's going to be them. And if you have to put a coloring sheet in for some reason, I mean, I don't ban anything because I trust my leaders. Draw yourself in it. Like, let's engage. The coloring sheet is the lowest common denominator of engagement, isn't it? It's, we can do so much better. And if we, if we give them, sometimes what we'll do is we'll just throw out a bunch of stuff, plasticine and feathers and pipe cleaners and oh, who knows, glue, who knows what. And we just have this pretty amazing things come out of it. But the more open-ended it is, the more it allows the children to engage. So I actually fully agree with you, but more because I hate the mess. <laughs> and it's so time-consuming when we could be so much more engaging, but I don't know. What do you think of just an open-ended mess? Can that? You, well, you said ban all crafts. Prescribed crafts or all crafts? Prescribed crafts. Yeah. Yes. So it's their imagination that's being exercised. Rather than the uh, ego of the adult. Yeah. yeah. And you know, and I think one of the problems in children's ministry is we tend to attract adults with really vivid imaginations. So they get nurtured. But the question is, are the children being nurtured? Yeah. Yeah. That's so profound. I'm just going to let that comment sit. That's, that the adults get nurtured and they, they get to engage in all their ideas. And the kids then are copying what the adults are doing, and they're not engaging themselves. Yeah? What, what do you think age groups this is? What age groups do you think this, is, this type of, uh, of program would be best for? Um, I think in different contexts, you can start, and depending on your church and your kids and different contexts, it's not a one-size-fits-all. I would be really comfortable in seeing this very successful with kids kind of grade th three years old, up through kind of seven or eight or nine even, and then the older children start to help the younger children. So if there are older children involved, we um, a couple times a year run intergenerational children's ministry, so we have the teenagers involved. The teenagers love getting into this, and they remember doing it. Oh, remember when we used to build the ark, and then they're making the second sale, and they've got the complicated things going. I wouldn't use this as a staple in ministry for older kids because they're ready for more abstract thinking now. Um, but I would think probably up to age 10 or 11, and that'd be my guess. And I would, I'm a firm believer in trying it, and if it doesn't work, try something else. <laughs> yeah? The risk is that the children might um, go somewhere that we don't want to go with the story. The children might engage with it in ways that we've never thought of. And we might have our own idea of what this story is supposed to mean. And I think we need to be really careful with bringing our own because we all have our theological agendas, we all have our lenses, we all have our biases. And Theolog our theology is a very important part of the church, right? We're grounding, the church is grounded on theology, so we want to keep that basis. But I have seen this a thousand times, but we bring our own agendas to the stories. And like the story I told you about, the children in the boat, or a, a calming the storm, and the teacher really wanting to say, this means that... Um, this and this and this and this, and things that the, the story doesn't tell us, but that are part of what she's bringing or she thinks she's supposed to say. So um, ch children are going to say things and challenge us. Jesus says, you know, come, become like the children, because you need to, you adults, there's something about the kingdom of God that you don't know that they know. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so that's kind of a... A vague answer to a very, very important question. I have had 
time and again had children. Anybody give children's talks in, in, in front of the church? Anybody ever do that? I hate doing those. But I love and hate doing those. Being up there and you ask a question that you think is very innocuous and a kid says something that you were not expecting <laughs> and you're up there in front of the church thinking, oh, what do I do? <laughs> so that kind of thing happens all the time. But um, we need to embrace childhood and let children be children and bring their own thoughts, their own experiences, their own wonderings. Thanks for asking that. I'm going to think about that more and come up with a better answer next time. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, getting back to I helped to abolish caps too. Prescribed. Prescribed caps. Yes. <laughs> All I'm saying is that I feel that I've seen it in my own children who have gone through the Montessori post, but the Montessori yeah. classroom. And then one of their biggest struggles is going into the public school system hmm. and then, you know, being told how they're supposed to yeah. outcome. So then yeah. transferring that into a Sunday school environment where these kids are all And we were in exactly the same situation because there were a lot of kind of Montessori, Waldorf families, um, Reggio Emilio families at our church. And when we started doing this, our kids went into public school and we were kind of shocked, thinking, wow, there's some really different approaches to learning out there. So I'll just give you some quick ideas. And I actually have written a little booklet about this called Reimagining Children in the Church that I'll pass to you if you want some ideas. And there are some wonderful ideas out there for doing this. So what I've just presented, like using open-ended ideas, props, inviting people in, at the children in. What are we going to build? Building props? There's, this for us is Elijah's chariot. It's um, Noah's ark. It's a, it's a house and we're lowering somebody through the ceiling to be healed. It's, it's different every week. My favorite is once a year when it becomes an empty tomb and we cover it with black cloth. And we have the grave closed inside. And we invite the children, would you like to look in? And sometimes they don't. It's too much. And sometimes they don't. And, and they'll say, I didn't last year, but I really want to this year. And it's a profound experience of being there. And, and your imagination is there and you're inviting. And so I'm a really big believer in props and engagement. Not props, exactly prescribed props. Like, we're not going to give them the kitchen. We're going to give them the cardboard box. And that's what these kind of play stands, fabrics, chairs, the fort building principle is. So that kind of thing. Somebody in my um, church is a teacher and she came up with this dice, who, what, where, when, why, how. And we use it a bit just to kind of get the older kids thinking. And we let the kids roll the dice and ask each other questions just to kind of start the conversation. So they'll maybe roll. They love doing this. Um, where? Okay, so we're doing the story of Jesus and calming the storm. Um, and some, one of the kids has to ask a where question. Um, where did the disciples think they were going if the boat tipped to the bottom of the lake or something? Like they might say something ridiculous or where were the disciples going when they got in the boat they were going across the lake. And just kind of to get those, I, mean, for, I wouldn't use this with younger kids, but for the older kids, get that cognitive stuff going. Get us thinking about the story, but really we want to live in it. Um, God, I want to give you so many things. Thinking about our space, making our space an uh, area that's conducive to um, being in a spiritual environment, to awakening our spiritual lives. We think so carefully about our worship space for adults. Somebody, um, Catherine or Patrick, said, I, for children, we're often, we relegate them to the basement. But the Reggio Emilio School believes the environment is the third teacher. And I've seen profound truth in that. If we set up an environment, it can call this kind of creativity out of children that d draws them in to um, a learning experience. So Jerome Berryman has lots of ideas about this as well, how we set up a space, <sighs> lots of uh, spirituality, engagements that we can do with children that help them um, calm down and, and still themselves. 
and as, as a way so we've lived in a story and we want to maybe we want to I mean different weeks we're going to want to do different things we want to bring our children to a place where they can find stillness in themselves and then explore the story from that very deep place inside them that they don't often get to go to in our culture is that I mean, just give, trying to give you some practical ideas we have found that we never run out of ideas no we always run out of ideas we always have a backup kind of plasticine because any story can be built with plasticine because with the children we're working with stories not abstract principles so we always have a backup that we nearly never use maybe once a year the backup will get used and maybe it'll be a basket of plasticine while we're running out of time nobody's imagination is really going this week so we're going to pull out the plasticine and then we're going to say what are we going to build but usually we just let we let the kids play in the story we let the kids play in the story and they do I wonder if you tried it, what you would find. I always encourage people to try a small thing, not try to change everything, because um, that's maybe too much, but to try it. Try inviting children in. Bring some cardboard boxes and see what they do. Over years of doing this with kids in our context, it doesn't feel as much of a risk anymore, but we still stand back sometimes and watch the kids saying, I can't believe this works. I can't believe it's so simple. We decided we were going to make it simpler, keep it simple, and then make it simpler, and make it simpler. The more simple we made it, the more the kids responded, the more the kids engaged. And the easier for, it was for us to plan, because the strategy we were using was story, imagination, Holy Spirit, Adults get out of the way and let the kids come in and, and give some direction, certainly. But don't kill those aha moments and don't kill what the children are doing. Those wonder, wondering questions are brilliant. Um, we probably use them every week. And it's developing a really wonderful theological reflection for when the kids are older. Now that we've been doing the wondering questions for 10 years, we find our teenagers use it still when they're doing more abstract things. They say, I wonder about that. And so it's really, we've seen it really roots people long term. Amy? I was just thinking about the, the riskiness. Yeah. And the risk factor. And I wonder if um, one of the risks actually comes from parents or other adults who are, yeah. who are kind of still in that outcome, outcome space mode. Yeah. Yeah. And so what do we do with that? Do you have a thought on that? One of the easiest ways to deal with that would be to approach it before it becomes a problem. So if your church is deciding to switch into a program like this, all the parents in say, listen, we're going to make some changes. Here's what we're going to be doing from now on. And you're going to do it for the next year. If it doesn't work, we'll go back to the first one. And then we give the parents an opportunity to um, encourage the children at home too to continue the story, continue playing. You know, what was your part in that play today? You know, what kind of things did you bring into the box? What was your favorite part? Did you like playing with the fabric? You know, and then they can start having that conversation with their kids at home and they can yeah. engage them a little bit more. But I think you go to the parents first and say, this is what we're going to be trying out. They just need to be a little bit open to it. Yeah, thanks for that. The adult voice can really overwhelm children, and we're, we're tempted to give our kids noise, 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 and tell us about this, tell us about this. And sometimes my own children say to me, "Mom, just stop! Like, leave me, leave me alone. I don't, <laughs> I don't." 
they, they want to live in that experience and not have an adult constantly framing it and processing it for them. And we're taking, we're robbing them of a chance to do that. So I do, th I think that um, it, it makes me so happy when the incumbent or the pastor of a church takes an interest in what's happening with the children and we can be doing something consistently across the board to be saying, um, let the children be children and let's learn from them, but let's not suffocate them. So um, it's really a team thing. I have found it's both a blessing and a curse in children's ministry because usually I'm below anybody's notice. Nobody has a clue what I'm doing. And I've actually found that quite liberating because I stay out of most church politics that way. But um, I sometimes I think I have a deal with the, my, one of my best friends and colleagues who's the director of our church, Tim. Come and look at what we do once a year because you should know you're in charge of this church. You should know if we're doing something that's rubbish or that's meaningful. And so over the years we've communicated this and we work together to try to cast a vision that is true for everyone, that it's messy and it's complicated. And he could just as easily be killing the stories for the adults. It's not only um, children who need to live in the mystery of what God is doing in the universe. If we start telling the adults how neat and packaged it is, like this is just not, maybe it's, it's not my life. <laughs> it's not my life. And to have that space to live in this and know that it's not kind of tidy at the end always. Um, and God meets us there, and that's the story we're in. I find remarkable freedom and health in that that is actually profoundly helpful to me as I live my life as an adult. And I, so I think that these principles that we're talking about are actually true for everybody. Um, my own mission in the church is to try to think about this for children. But I, I think there's a lot of wisdom here for adults. I only have a minute or two, so I'm going to hear this and I'm going to finish something. No, go ahead. I'm going to read you a great quote. Thank you so much for that. You know, you just made me think, we're really talking about something I talked about earlier about this consumerist culture we live in that has made its way into the education system and into the church. We want input and output. We want a product. We want to know that we got our money's worth. <laughs> and we're not talking about commodities. We're talking about children. We're talking about becoming human beings. We're, we're talking about something more like growing potatoes, right? That happens underground. And you plant potatoes in end of June and July, and you don't see what's happening for a long time. You just trust that something's going on under there. And if you dig them up all the time to see what's kind of happening, if you dig it up every Sunday to say, OK, let's see what you I mean, come end of August, you're not going to have a crop. <laughs> you got to leave it alone. You got to trust that God is doing this and that we don't need to constantly add our voice or direction. Or, there's a lot of trust here. Um, yeah? I just have one question. Yeah? This, the, the idea of God being play and story, it, it seems really good for kids who are extroverted, kids who, who live life you know, on their mouth and on, you know, yeah. How do you deal with kids? Oh, it's wonderful. We've got those, my kids. Okay, I'm just, yeah. Because I'm just wondering, do you have a space where, yeah. where these quieter children can go to explore their own interpretation of the story, maybe on their own, or, you know, a prayer corner, or something that, that, that will appeal to children who may not necessarily want to be a direct part of the story yeah. you want to explore. Thank you for that. 
This is actually perfect for the introvert, so I'm so glad you raised that. My guess is Amy's going to talk about some of this in the spirituality workshop, because there are some wonderful tools for allowing people to have that quiet space, and I think it's one of the best things we can give our kids, is a chance to, exp be, to be still, and it's an incredible gift for the extroverts, too, to learn how to be still. In my three kids, I've got a strong extrovert and two quieter ones, and I'm so glad that in church, the, the quiet, louder one is taught to find that still voice. But, so we're doing the calming the storm, and who do you want to be? A quieter child might decide they're going to be a little fish off swimming over there. Or they might be watching from the shore, and we can offer things as well. I, I always try to, at the beginning, invite children to choose who they want to be on their own, but I wonder if we need um, a little mouse on the boat. Or just kind of use our imaginations. The earth has a role in a lot of these, most all of these stories, the earth has a role. So I have found that um, the introverts can, in, in the Bible stories, there's always bystanders, people watching, there's always little animals or stones that are going to cry out. Um, so I, I think we, we can release our imaginations and let the children choose the part that meets them. I want to end because we have to break, but I want to tell you something. I'll read you a quote by Sophia Cavaletti, who is, I think, one of the most wonderful voices in children's spirituality. Um, she says, the good ch but with children, right? Jesus says we need to become like the children. Because they know things that we don't know about God. And she talks about the Good Shepherd. I'm sure you're all reading it. I'll paraphrase it because I can't read backwards. She says, the adults know the story of the Good Shepherd, right? That the Good Shepherd is going to care for his sheep. He's going to keep to protect them from the wolves. He's going to, I don't know, lead them to the pastures. But what do the kids know? The children know. The good shepherd knows the best grass to grow in, or the muddiest place to roll, or where you can see the best view of the stars at night. And when we embrace childhood, children can open up the story of God's interaction with the world to us in ways that we have forgotten and in ways that nourish us so deeply and that nourish them as well when we embrace childhood, when we let them be children. I had so hoped we were going to do a lot more application, but thank you so much. We're going to end on that, and I'm glad to talk to people about this more. I'm really glad for people to send me emails and share ideas of what you've been doing. I'm sure you've got really wonderful ideas, and I'd love to hear how things like this go in your own church.